Hello YouTube, thank you for stopping by. As always, please click like if you happen to enjoy this video, please click on subscribe, and if you'd like to be notified when I publish future videos, just click on that bell-shaped notify button. Additionally, I'd love to hear from you, so be sure to leave me a comment and please share this video with anyone else you think might enjoy it as well. Alrighty then. In this video, I'm taking the photos that I took during my recent kitchen remodel, and I'm making a slideshow of them so I can share the information on YouTube. I hope you find it informative. Back in 1996, when we bought our house, the flippers who remodeled the kitchen used cheap vinyl-clad particle board cabinets and cheap ceramic tiles as the countertop. It looked nice for a while, but this stuff didn't age very well because it was all really cheap crap. Additionally, they installed the cabinets before laying down the floor tiles. This will end up complicating matters a little bit. Later on, in 2004 I think, we retiled the floors throughout the house, which involved a lot of manual labor. Since the kitchen cabinets were still in decent shape at that time, we just left them be. We therefore decided that we would be laying tiles around the cabinets, just like the previous tiles had been, rather than pulling out the cabinets and laying tiles under them. For one thing, I didn't think the cabinets would survive being uninstalled, and since we couldn't afford to replace the cabinets at this time, our hands were more or less tied. Over the years, though, we did replace the refrigerator and the range, and also installed a hood vent microwave above the range. Even the dishwasher was replaced at some point. After 25 years, though, we had had enough, and the decision was made to finally replace the kitchen cabinets and countertops. We decided on a style and placed our order to coincide with an upcoming vacation week that we had planned several months before, but it was going to be a staycation anyway, so why not make the best use of that time? The first thing we did was empty out the cabinets into boxes, and then we removed the doors. As you can no doubt imagine, we were really looking forward to getting rid of those crappy cabinets and countertops. We've decided that we're going to replace this door as well, but it will have to wait for now. Okay, time to remove the old cabinets. We left the kitchen sink and its cabinet until the very last moment. The rest of the cabinets were removed and the oven disconnected from the gas line. At this point, we didn't know if we would need to remove the microwave, but eventually we did. This pile are the remnants of the old cabinets. There are similar piles of cabinet doors and the front oak panels off camera. We broke everything down so it could all get into our short bed pickup truck to take to the dump. That same day, we were also able to pick up our new cabinets. We stored the boxes on our patio, stacked up in the order we need to install them. My wife picked out a new, lighter, brighter paint color and painted the exposed wall surfaces. We are thinking about replacing the refrigerator while we're at it. This white one will not match the other appliances very well, and there's also some rust stains around the water dispenser. Time for it to go. Only the visible areas of the walls, not being covered by cabinets, actually need to get painted. The project is moving along quite well, and we are looking forward to an updated kitchen. Now that the old cabinets are gone, we can fill in the voids with the scrap pieces of tile that we held on to from back in 2004. Since the new cabinets have different dimensions, it's important that they have a level surface to sit on. My wife does a great job laying tiles. She laid the tiles in our den as well as our enclosed patio. My knees and my back are very grateful. As an example, this is the space under the tall pantry cabinet. The new cabinet's going to be shifted three inches to the right, so you can see it would be a bit of a problem. Interestingly, we didn't have to cut any tiles for this work here at all. We found enough leftover tile pieces to fill in all the voids without having to cut anything. We used a quick drying thin set mix, one that cures in four hours, so that the tiles would be set by the next morning, rather than having to wait a full 24 hours before we could resume any work. 
The next morning we added the grout. Fortunately, we had kept a bag from when we did the floors previously, so the colors will match once the grout has dried. Although it's not as if anyone's ever going to see it until the cabinets get pulled out again many years from now. We are both surprised that we didn't have to cut any tiles to do this. Even when we had odd measurements, we found the pieces that would fit right in. We were even able to create a pattern in the tiles as we laid them out, not that anyone will ever see it until the cabinets are ripped out again. The next step was to temporarily place 1 inch by 2 inch wood rails on the walls to assist holding the weight of the cabinets as they are mounted. I had bought a laser level that mounts on a tripod to assist with this, but it wasn't working very well. Actually, it turned out that I just wasn't very familiar with how to use it correctly. I got it working later on. My wife came up with a practical solution and we used a trim piece from the new cabinets to measure the distance from the ceiling to the temporary support rail. We added in a paint stirring stick for an extra 3 16 inch fudge factor. It worked perfectly. The new cabinets were fairly easy to assemble, kind of like IKEA furniture. I debated using glue on the joints as well, but eventually decided not to due to the cure time and having to keep cleaning up drips and runs. It seemed solid enough once assembled, so I just went with it. I didn't have an appropriate length 1 8 inch drill bit for the pilot holes needed when attaching the 3 inch wide spacer boards to the cabinet front panels. Home Depot didn't have anything but a really long one. So I measured and cut the long one with a cutoff blade in a handheld grinder so it was the perfect length, and then just cleaned it up with a flap disc. Worked great. In this picture, I've got the first cabinet mounted with a spacer on the far right against the wall. The spacer is there to keep the upper and lower cabinets lined up vertically, as the lower cabinet requires the spacer to keep its drawers from hitting the patio door frame. The tool in the lower right of the picture is an expandable support shaft that helps to support the front of the cabinet while getting it positioned and anchored against the back wall. This is yours truly getting the front panels of the first and second cabinets lined up and screwed together. The doors on the first cabinet came pre-installed on the front panel, probably because there are two doors but the smaller single door cabinets appear to come without the doors pre-hung for more flexibility. You can mount the hinges on whichever side suits your needs better. I think it's a great idea, but I'll hang those doors later. We are also installing a full height pantry cabinet which measures eight feet tall exactly. Unfortunately, our ceiling is also eight feet tall and it's uneven and sags slightly in some places since we also have floor tiles, this poses a bit of a problem. The existence of floor tiles combined with an uneven ceiling height necessitates that the cabinet walls be shorted by at least 3 16 of an inch and even more in some places. Due to its size, this cabinet had to be assembled in the kitchen in close proximity of its final resting place it would not be possible to assemble it elsewhere and lift it up into place. There just isn't enough room to do that. Although the work was spread over two separate days, in principle, this one cabinet took a full day to get installed due to the multiple measurements, cuttings, test fittings, and my inexperience. So much fun. After sealing the wall around the water and drain pipes for the kitchen sink with some leftover silicone from another project, I take another measurement and determine that the hot water pipe will need to be relocated because the pantry cabinet and spacer boards that were just installed nudges the dishwasher closer to the sink by 6 inches. This means that the hot water pipe will be too close to the cabinet wall to be usable. What fun! This is me trying to decide if there is a better solution. There isn't. Figures. I suppose it looks like crap anyways, especially with all that brown silicone. Maybe it'll look better after I've made some changes. I contemplate cutting out and removing the abandoned stub of a black drain pipe that used to go to the sink in an old garage that I tore out a couple years back, but there's no easy way to do this because the pipes are all glued together and I just can't risk creating a bigger problem if what I do doesn't work. 
I will, however, be able to clean up the mess that is the hot and cold water pipes and valves, and the kink in that water pipe also has to go. The new stubs for the hot and cold water pipes are now in place and anchored to the stud. Next will be to replace the drywall. The water valves themselves will go on once the sink cabinet is in place. Gotta love PEX tubing and shark bite fittings. Really makes this work easier. My wife points out that a couple of the kitchen outlets are too low and will cause problems with the new 6 inch tall backsplash that will go on the countertops. Basically, all of the outlets in this kitchen need to be moved up so that the bottom of the hole for the outlet is at the 43 and a half inch mark. So I turn off the breaker, remove the outlet and wiring box, and then measure the part of the drywall that needs to be cut out. So far, so good. Now to move that cut out chunk of drywall to the bottom of the hole. I make use of a paint stirring stick and some white glue and get the hole moved up to match the other outlets in the kitchen. Well, it's been patched and spackled. Now just need to sand it down a bit, apply some knockdown texture, let that dry, sand a little more, and paint. This three gang wiring box is used for a couple switches and an outlet, but it too needs to be moved up a bit to match the other outlets and clear the backsplash. Here, the wiring box has been pulled out from the wall, but some of the wires are really short, so I will have to work around the partially removed box. Here the drywall has been marked for cutting, and the marked chunk of drywall has been cut out. Now to put in a backing for the replacement drywall. Again, a chunk of paint stirring stick and some white glue will serve as the backing plate. Here we have the backing plate in place. It should be noted that the screws will be removed once all the glue has dried. I didn't like the loose fit that this wiring box had using the piece of drywall that I removed from above it. So I took some discarded chunks of drywall, glued and secured them in place, and got a much better fit. Again, once the glue has dried, all these screws will be removed. Here the screws have been removed and the drywall patch has now been spackled. Just need to sand it a bit and use some knockdown spray. I guess I went a little overboard with the spray-on knockdown texturing, but it'll be fine once it is dried and sanded and painted. I took this opportunity to install an additional outlet above where the dishwasher will be positioned, as this will be the new home for the coffee machine and electric tea kettle. The hole for the wiring box could not have been placed better. While I knew about the stud's location, I thought the vent pipe for the kitchen sink was further down the wall. I totally lucked out. The wiring box has plenty of room, and no repositioning or cutting of drywall is required. Huzzah! This is where the microwave oven needs to go. A few years ago, we removed an empty cabinet and installed an above-range microwave with an integrated hood vent fan. The vent pipe placement was much farther forward than what would be done typically due to there being a ceiling joist in the way where we needed to put the hole in the ceiling. To make things more interesting, the microwave oven was about an inch too high as well, so the new cabinet wouldn't even fit without some major manipulation. Since the vent pipe was so far forward, it didn't look like we were going to be able to use the cabinet we bought to cover the vent pipe so I suggested that we paint the pipes black and go with an industrial look. Here, my wife is painting the one section of pipe that was more or less permanently glued to the ceiling. I spray painted the other vent pipe pieces as well as the mounting brackets outside and started getting everything remounted once they were dry. Shortly after the microwave was reinstalled, I noticed that the vent fan wasn't working correctly. Murphy's Law. So it all had to come down again so I could troubleshoot the fan and get it repaired. It was at this point that my wife suggested a technique that I've used a couple times before on previous projects. Specifically, why not use a backer board to push the microwave out from the wall a bit further? 
This would also allow us to lower the microwave as needed, and then we could still make use of the cabinet we had bought to cover the vent pipes. She's brilliant, I tell you. I also took the opportunity to replace the single socket outlet with a typical dual socket version, which will give me a place to connect some under cabinet LED lighting in the near future. Here the vent fan has been repaired and the microwave oven reinstalled onto the new backing board an inch lower and bringing it out of the way from the wall an additional three quarters of an inch allowing us to use the new cabinet. I cut up the unused rear wall of the cabinet to use as spacers to the right and left in order to secure and support the sides of the new cabinet since it's not a full cabinet. The back, top, and bottom have all been removed. Here the next cabinet has just been mounted. The laser level was an easy way to keep track of the location of the wall studs after the cabinet was raised up, which ended up covering the marks on the wall. Since this cabinet was so narrow and only had a stud on the far right, I added in additional backing support and used a couple toggle bolts to provide additional anchoring for this cabinet. With no kitchen to speak of, my wife has to be creative when it comes to cooking. Besides just getting restaurant food as takeout, she uses a hot plate, as seen here, or a crock pot, or the microwave. We also have a full kitchen in the RV that you can see through the window. We have also been using the barbecue grill a lot as well. Dishes get washed in the big sink that I have in the garage. Here we have a couple of the lower cabinets put in place temporarily so that we can look at the placement of the oven and the cabinets next to it. The oven was moved in place temporarily for measuring purposes and another upper cabinet has been mounted. We started putting up some of the missing cabinet doors. As mentioned previously, some come pre-mounted while others do not. With single door cabinets, the upside is that it gives us flexibility as to which side the hinges are mounted on. I'm sure this is by design. With cabinets that have double doors though, I cannot understand why some would be shipped with the doors pre-hung, but others are not. Kinda silly if you ask me. The doors for the pantry cabinet were a bit of a pain, but we got them in eventually. No longer temporary, these cabinets have finally been joined, reinforced, and made plumb, square, and level. Can't find the saw I was going to use to trim off the shims, so I'll either stop by and buy another one, or maybe use a Dremel. The oven has been made level and is in its position. We have also finished mounting the missing cabinet doors. Starting to look pretty good. My wife has picked out some nice handles for the door and drawer pulls. I bought a DeWalt reversible offset pull saw for flush cutting the shims. Possibly a bit more aggressive than I was looking for, but it cut through the shims with ease. All the shims have been cut flush, and the cabinets are all still level, so no shifting. Bonus! I'll need to remember to pick up some silicone for the bottom front edge of these cabinets and on each side of the shims themselves so that they don't move. The first few drawers have been assembled and are in place now as well. My wife decided to use blue painter's tape as temporary drawer pulls. Whatever works. I almost forgot to mention, but while I was out shopping for that saw to cut the shims, my wife assembled the next few cabinets. Another evening and another pair of cabinets reinforced, joined, and installed level, plumb, and square. Cutouts for the oven's electrical and gas as well. It's also very apparent that the current white refrigerator just doesn't cut it aesthetically, so I'm really glad we already ordered a replacement. I also added an outlet that will be inside an upper cabinet near the sink. It will be to provide power to under cabinet LED lights later on. Rather than spending money on a new outlet, I'm reusing one that I salvaged from the single car garage that I tore out a few years ago. No one is going to see it, so it doesn't matter if the colors don't match. The wiring box and faceplate were also leftovers from a prior project. No waste. It also saves me a trip to Home Depot. Here I've added the temporary support bar for the cabinet that will be above the refrigerator. Now we're getting ready to install the cabinet above the refrigerator. We're getting closer. This side of the kitchen is almost done and it's looking good. 
Additionally, the new refrigerator looks much better than the old white one. The spacer between the pantry and the dishwasher has been installed. The dishwasher is in place and leveled. I think I'll have to cut a custom piece of 3 quarter inch plywood to mount above the dishwasher as there will be too much of a gap if I leave it the way it is. The sink cabinet is also moved into position and test fitted. Much cleaner cutouts for pipes and electrical in the new sink cabinet, especially when compared to the cutouts in the old sink cabinet. This picture really doesn't do it any justice. The cutouts made by whoever did the original installation are just hideous. I know that no one but me is ever going to really look at these, but I'm happy. The last of the upper cabinets are in place now as well. The bottom of this spacer between the pantry and the dishwasher went straight to the floor for some reason and wasn't set back a few inches like the cabinets and even the dishwasher were. So I decided to move the sink cabinet away, pull out the dishwasher, and modify this spacer so it would be a better match to the rest of the cabinets. Here's the modified spacer with the bottom cut off and set back appropriately to match the pantry. I had to take my time and work carefully because I only had one shot at making this modification. Thankfully, everything turned out perfectly. Another item on my to-do list was to figure out how I wanted to deal with an outlet that would be covered by the last cabinet. I didn't want to have to access the outlet from down inside the cabinet, so I hardwired a pigtail extension and I installed a wiring box and an outlet into the side of the cabinet. While I'm sure it's not up to code, it's good enough for me. This outlet even boasts a couple USB charger ports as well. The cabinet installation is basically done at this point. Everything is attached securely to the wall studs, made level and plumb, and the shims have all been trimmed off. All the doors and drawers are also in place. I used the old doors from the previous cabinets as temporary countertops, and the first thing to get set out are the coffee machine and the tea kettle. We always have our priorities. I called and scheduled the quartz countertop installation. Looks like that isn't going to happen for another three and a half weeks. Oh well, what's a few more days without a kitchen sink? I also purchased a couple of these remote controlled LED ribbon light kits from Home Depot to use as under cabinet lighting with the new kitchen cabinets. I also bought some mounting rails with light diffusing covers. The problem I had with this was that the kits don't come with a wall mounted remote and I don't want to use velcro or magnets or anything cheesy like that. Besides, I tend to lose stuff like this if it's not permanently attached to something. I could just buy a wall mounted remote for 28 bucks, but my solution will be much cheaper and it's just as good. On one of my previous trips to Home Depot, I had seen this two-piece cover plate which is designed to hide the cover plate screws and I figured it was thick enough to hold the actual remote. All I needed to do was to cut out a portion of the backing plate so that the remote would actually fit and then use a file to clean up the cuts a little bit. The remote fits perfectly. This is going to work. I did have to add some new screw holes for mounting. Here's the remote in the wall mount and it even works. Here's my $4 solution now mounted to the wall. After that, I install the actual lighting strips and the mounting rails and covers. Installation completed and everything works. Huzzah! I have wanted these under cabinet lights for years, but couldn't justify the cost until the LED strip lights came down in price. But by then, I couldn't bring myself to install them on my old crappy cabinets because I didn't want to spend any money on them. However, I'm still waiting on the new countertops though. After this, it was time to install the pull handles. This template really helped, although being plastic, it just barely lasted long enough to do my kitchen. And it had to be thrown away once the uh, kitchen pull handles have all been installed. I was amazed at just how much nicer the cabinets looked once the pull handles were all in place. Judge for yourself. After waiting the three and a half weeks, it was time to get the new countertops installed. So early in the morning, we removed the temporary countertops, the old doors from the previous cabinets. And then we put dish towels on top of the items that were now exposed just to help protect them a bit. An expert team of five hardworking guys appeared at 1030 that morning. 
After a quick check of the kitchen to determine if we were actually ready, they sorted out their tools and workspace out front, power, water, clearances, pathways, shifting of living room furniture, then a closer inspection of the cabinet installation. Everything was plumb, square, and level. The lead guy who asked who did the installation seemed impressed when I told them that my wife and I did it ourselves. The guy nodded once and said, good job. I was quite pleased with myself at that point. First they installed three quarter inch thick plywood backer boards to support the quartz countertops. Next they created custom templates for cutting the quartz. I was very pleased to watch them working so meticulously and making multiple measurements. We joked about the measure twice, cut once rule. They were measuring more than twice. Then I mentioned the version measure once, cuss twice. The crew didn't get it until the lead guy translated for them and then they chuckled. One of the crews said, yeah, and at these prices, then you go look for another job. I'm going to have to remember this particular technique for making templates using 1 8 inch thick wooden boards and hot glue. It was very fast, accurate, and efficient. Their continual use of straight edges and squares was very pleasing. They even made use of a paper template for the kitchen sink. There are three full slabs of quartz that need to be measured, marked, cut, and sanded smooth before being installed. Watching them measure multiple times before cutting was very pleasing. I think I've probably already mentioned that. One of the needs for the templates is to be able to cut the back edges of these countertops precisely so that they mate to the walls correctly because no wall is perfectly flat. Here one of the installers is color matching the epoxy resin that will be used wherever the pieces of quartz are joined together. The quick setting activator isn't added until just before application. Here they are cutting out the hole for the sink. These guys were really working their asses off. They had done an install earlier this morning at some other house and they were on their second stop for the day when they got to my house around 10.30. When finished, they will be going to yet another house to do even more countertops. Busy guys. Here he's cutting the hole for the sink into the plywood backer board after lots of measuring, use of a template, as well as the sink itself. These guys are definitely adhering to the measure more than once before cutting rule. There was sufficient leftover material to make a great backsplash behind the stove. Here they're drilling the hole for the kitchen faucet. The kitchen faucet test fit was okay. I'll be taking care of the plumbing in the next day or two. We also had sufficient leftover 6 inch backsplash material to be able to cut a piece down to fit into the kitchen windowsill. Needless to say, we are very happy with the results. I still have to push the stove back a bit, reconnect the plumbing under the sink, and do the molding strips and mop boards, but we're getting closer. Over the weekend, I got the disposal installed and wired up. I also installed the drain pipes and connected the plumbing. Everything works and there's no leaks so far. We're almost done. Here's a closer view of the new quartz countertop material. We really love it. A few years ago, the gold color on the rim and hardware of these ceiling lamps was looking a bit dated, so I painted all those metal bits with a couple coats of a gloss black Rust-Oleum spray paint. The results are good, and the black accents really fit this new kitchen. Now to address the gaps on the east wall. Since this wall isn't straight and flush, the resulting gaps, which vary from half an inch to three quarters of an inch wide, need to have some backing to be able to support the molding strips themselves. So I ended up taking some narrow strips of half inch thick plywood scraps and used some hot glue to mount these scraps directly on the wall just below the surface of the edges of the cabinets. Then the molding strips were cut to length and then held in place with hot glue as well. A big advantage of using hot glue is how quickly it sets so you don't have to hold it in place for very long. Additionally, mistakes typically just peel right off. Next came a bead of silicone on the bottom front edge of the cabinets, followed by cutting some veneering strips to length and using some liquid nails construction adhesive to glue and mount them on the bottoms of the cabinets. So, I guess the kitchen's done now, except for a little touch-up painting. 
Although it was a lot more work than I had anticipated, my wife is happy, and that's all that really matters. I have to admit that I'm pretty happy with the results as well. Okay, I guess that's it for this video. Remember, please click like if you happened to enjoy this video. If you haven't done so already, I'd really appreciate it if you would please click on subscribe. And if you would like to be notified when I publish future videos, just click on that bell-shaped notify button. Additionally, I'd love to hear from you, so be sure to leave me a comment and please share this video with anyone you think might enjoy it as well. Bye for now. <laughs>